Hey everybody, Shane Presley here, Rock Paper Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another brand new episode of the show. Today's features returning guest, my buddy, typewriter Tim. We had a great time hanging out at his home, talking uh, about... He's actually getting ready to jump on a motorcycle today and head across the country. Uh, We talk all about this adventure that he's getting ready to uh, take off on. So, uh, yeah, sit back and enjoy this one. It's a lot of fun. Great conversation. A lot of uh, interesting stuff came through in this one. Do want to remind you that Rock Paper Podcast is brought to you by Roughneck Beard Company and American Rambler, located here in St. Louis, Missouri, over in the Maplewood area. You can swing by their shop and uh, pick up all your favorite all-natural beard oils, your beard balms, and uh, you know it's warming up, it's summertime, maybe check out their junk powder, or uh, one of my personal favorites, their Roughneck Beard Batter. Roughneck Beard Batter is the ultimate beard and skin moisturizer. It's a blend of eight nutrient-rich soft oils whipped directly into unrefined shea butter for a moisturizing kick like no other. The highest amount of triglycerides and fatty acids available in the beard care market, hands down, world-renowned, but made right here in St. Louis. If you can't make it to the store, you can shop 24-7 at roughneckbeardcompany.com. Use my code RPP15 for an exclusive 15% off your entire purchase. And um, even if you don't have a beard, American Rambler's got you taken care of. You can visit them for all your grooming needs and uh, pick up some wonderful locally sourced products and uh, support local business. Also, big shout out to Heil Sound for their continued support of this show and helping make everything sound great. Shop HeilSound.com today and get yourself a brand new microphone. And if you also uh, would like to help support this show, a great way to do so would be visiting the all-new Rock Paper Podcast merch store. Um, head on over to buyjack.com slash rockpaperpodcast and check out the uh, shirts, tank tops. we got some trucker snapback hats up there. Um, yeah, any, whatever you, uh, any of that stuff you sound, sound interesting to you, check it all out there. Again, at buyjack.com in the Rock Paper Podcast merch store. Uh, your support means the world to me, so thank you, everybody. Um, again, we just passed seven years of doing this show. Uh, it's crazy to think about, but I, I really appreciate you all sticking with me and uh, helping me out, keeping continuing to listen to this show. And uh, if you need me, of course, everything's at rockpaperpodcast.com. Hit me up on the email, rockpaperpodcast at gmail. And uh, the socials, with all that out of the way, sit back, relax, and enjoy a brand new episode with typewriter Tim. Um, a podcast is kind of like a, it's like a radio show that's not on the radio. It's on, it's on the internet. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's also like my mom. Uh, it makes it sound more confusing, doesn't it? Uh, it sounds like this. This is Typewriter Tim in St. Louis, Missouri, and you're listening to Rock Paper Podcast. Rock Paper Podcast. This is beat paper, paper covers rock. Rock beats is the shame, covers nonstop, never know what new kind of guests that he's got coming at you. Live and direct on the spot could be rock, folk, country a hip-hop jazz all kind of folks that he has could be an artist or a comedian to make you laugh on the double deck of fudge round rolling round town shame coming at you live and direct from ground zero he's your hero he's your bestie rock paper podcast with shane presley Podcast. Hey everybody, Shane Presley here, Rock Paper Podcast, coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Hanging out with returning guest, Tim Jordan, a.k.a. Typewriter Tim. Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome back to the show, my friend. Oh man, you know I love this show, man. This is uh, this is super cool, man. Are we, uh, I haven't seen you in quite a while. I know uh, you, you uh, moved uh, for a while. and I keep trying to move, yeah. but... 
the 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 universe is moving me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, tried to move to Kansas, that didn't work. Didn't know what I was going to do. That didn't work. And then the world I mean, how do you describe what happened? Sure. Fell apart, whatever. And that put me in a trajectory where I've completely surrendered any and everything in my entire life. My career's gone. Uh, I guess they're coming back. We'll see. Yeah. Um, and that allowed me to completely reinvent myself. Yeah, man. Which we're going to, I mean, we got a lot to catch up on. Uh, but uh, I want to start with uh, just the, where this conversation started the other day. We met up and uh, I uh, reached out to uh, for some of your services uh, to, with your glass work that you've been doing. And uh, we, we kind of started talking then and uh, we sat, uh, was it Ch- in Chesterfield, we were in a parking lot for a moment talking and just... Uh, it was a nice, like, just in, you know, pretty in-depth conversation for, you know, two guys in a parking lot. Like, but we started talking about uh, uh, grief because I just lost my uh, pup a little bit ago and uh, my 17-year-old Beagle Bell. And uh, that uh, was, it was just a wild day, man. Like, we're, we're sitting there talking and then it's like I kind of a cloudy, rainy day all day and then all of a sudden... The skies kind of open up. The sun, uh, we got a big rainbow across the sky right right above us, and uh, incredible. Yeah. I mean, it could. The only way it could have been better is if the rainbow would have been coming off your head. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it the the weather matched the conversation. It started pretty somber. We started talking about grief because of the situation. Shane was dropping off some. Uh, Kermains or ash, as some people call it, uh, from his pup, and I me and my partner put those in glass and make uh, orbs, um, more or less a paperweight. I don't like to call them a paperweight because that trivializes really what they are. They're quite incredible sculpture, uh, multiple designs, but we swirl cremains into glass orbs in different designs. And Shane had hit me up to order it. So we met up uh, in a central location in Chesterfield, and man, I mean, the weather just matched our conversation. Start out sad; it's it's gloomy, it's kind of raining a little bit, and then as the conversation started shifting more towards healing and 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 the power of art connection, doing things like this, this rainbow fades behind you, and. I'd probably be more freaked out if we were talking about the Rainbow Bridge and those kind of things connecting right. to, you know, people say that people go over the Rainbow Bridge when we pass, especially pets and things like that. And I'm sitting there and this rainbow is coming in behind you as we're shifting the conversation. And I'm just like, wow. And I was just telling you that, you know, that didn't really hit me until I'm driving home. And it's those moments in life that, you know, we live for, but, you know, just wow, I mean, it's mind-blowing to be a part of such a thing. And yeah, it could have been just a random occurrence. Those things can happen. But uh, man, they keep happening in my life. And yeah. I'm sure a lot of people have the same experience. But uh, and wow, into a beautiful sunset, which that has metaphors, mm-hmm. that the sun came out from the rain, but the sun was still setting. And, you know, grief is crippling. It, 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 it it's in the abstract and you know i think it it speaks to what's been happening because i know a lot of people such as myself have had to grieve my career have had to grieve what i thought my life was going to end up like cuz all of a sudden the situation comes up my careers are on hold you know destroyed or, or whatever um but wow uh to experience life into m- work with grief in a certain way, accept it and try to find the healing in it. And, you know, these glass things have been incredible with each and every client through the whole process, you know, getting the pictures or looking up the pictures of, of who we are memorializing and just the process, you know, even some of the mundane emails going back and forth. I've had just the deepest connections and conversations with different people and different you know, stages of grief and a lot of people, grief is just in this weird abstract place. And when we can create something, um, it gives somebody something to hold, something to see and be reminded of, yeah, this really hurts and it's really hard. But at the same time, if we honor it 
it can be very, very beautiful. And it still hurts. And it's still kind of sad because we'll never get over missing um, those people or pets or, 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 or these things in our lives, um, you know, our careers. And, and to, to, to be honored to uh, do something like this has really changed my life and really blown me away. And, you know, we've connected deeper on it. It brought us kind of yeah, back man. together. Yeah. You know, made it because, you know, we get busy. We got to make a living. We got to do this. And sometimes we're separated. And, you know, it's these things that kind of start to connect us back up. And as hard as it can be, it reminds us that, you know, this life, love and time together is so very precious. And if I can ever have anything to do with any kind of healing, um, I'm all about it. Yeah, man. Yeah. It was, uh, I knew, like, I knew whenever, like, the time came that this was what I wanted to do because I'd seen your post in the past and I was like, but I, I didn't really know how the how the whole process was going to work, but I'm, like, so grateful that I did it uh, like this and then, turn, you know, turn, turned her into artwork and like this. And I guess it's just a really a, a powerful thing, man, like saying, like, oh, like you just described it. So I'm really uh, – it's a cool way to, to honor them. Uh, your- I say, you know, as a massage therapist, a yoga teacher – um, I've taught preschool. I've worked with a lot of different populations. And at this point, I'll say that art is the most healing, powerful healing tool that we have. Um, like one-on-one counseling, fantastic. I'd recommend it for everybody, whether you feel like you need it or not. Very powerful stuff. But art is pretty much a safe place to be yourself and s- and we'll draw things, and it's not even a matter of drawing things. Making art is 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 a feeling, and it, it we'll we'll draw and paint and make stuff that we don't want to talk about. And I've studied art; I have a degree in art, and we would always there's a cliche in art that everything you make is a self portrait. And I've watched just stuff come out of people that they would never talk about. And you wouldn't look at their art to see this terrible thing that happened to them. You know, it's like a flower growing out of some doo-doo. You know, you you don't focus on the doo-doo, you see the flower. But it's just so powerful to see and have that. And and sometimes it, it goes through us. Like, you didn't make this glass. But... You know, while I'm making it, they kind of, you know, through that process of me and my partner, you know, making the glass, they they make themselves. And, you know, to facilitate that, I feel a huge connection with my clients, even if I already know them, um, whether they send me pictures or not, or, or, you know, some of my clients that, you know, have had to drop their stuff off. So I haven't met them until I drop off their 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 memorials and in. in Man, it's just unbelievable how powerful art can be. Music's that way too, but it's a bit different. It's more immediate. When you're feeling, you're hearing that song and you're at that show, it's right there and you take it with you for the rest of your life. But an object is a little bit different. Um, I mean, obviously as an artist and musician, I love them both and in there's appropriate times. You could be looking at art and listening to music, which I'll talk about in a little bit on some stuff I got coming up. But man, I'm just so touched. Not just by you and, 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 and whatnot, just the whole process of, man, having something to do with somebody turning the corner of grief and not feeling as heartbroken um, and getting to the love part um, is very fascinating. And, and, you know, grief brought me to my our careers, uh, getting my stuff together, so to speak. You know, my grandfather died and that, you know, at a certain age where I'd never been touched by death before. And luckily it came later in life where I could process it differently in art school. And my life was forever changed. I realized that this stuff is precious. Time is precious and that life is not a joke and it's not something to take lightly. Um, we don't want to take it too seriously because that starts to ruin it and we get, you know, it just gets too heavy in the brain. But man, I mean, what a process and what a thing. I just really wish society would embrace that um, concept of making art because so many times I've taught people that tell me they can't make art and they tell me they can only do a stick figure. And when I worked at an open art studio for diverse, vulnerable people, you know, I'd hear that a lot and I would just hand someone a small piece of paper and write 
draw me a hundred stick figures on this little piece of paper and tell me it's not going to be cool. Because no matter what, you draw a hundred things on something, even if it's on the same spot, it, it, when you're done, it looks cool. And I, I have a degree in art and I can't hardly draw anything to make it look like something. Um, but I don't care. It's, it's the expression of it. My music is like that too. There's no songs in my music. We just jam. And it's like an abstract painting. Sometimes they don't turn out so well because they get muddy, so to speak, because there's too much going on. Right. But if you study that kind of vibe and get out of your own way and listen, you know, as much as, you know, the musicians and I play a lot of stuff, we're all listening intently. And that's really the difference. And yes, I have to deal with certain jazz skilled improvisational artists to do what I do. But you know, that's the beauty of it. It's just a free flow. It's not for everybody. Abstract art. Is, people look at Jackson Pollock's abstract splatter paintings and just be like, my kid can do that. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat accurate, but not really. But, you know, some people dig that and some people need a well-written song to, to get their groove. I get it. That's just not my vibe. But to be present and be in the moment is, is kind of what it's all about at this point for me. And, you know, that's... That's really all we have. Right. You know? Yeah, man. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I get like if people, I, I respond to like lyrical, you know, stuff for more, for music more and stuff. Yeah. Like, and like, and that's just where I'm, I gravitate towards, but like, I get tired of people like talking to bad about like certain things because like, it's just not for them. Like whatever it's, you know, I don't like, country music i don't like rap music or what you know whatever it is and it's like just because it's not for you doesn't mean you have to even bash the whole thing like a whole genre of music and stuff like it's hard for people to just say it's not for me right somebody, you know and it took art. me a long time yeah. you know and and if you're just like oh country music sucks right you know but but it's it's mature to say well it's just I, it's not for me right like we, i'm listening to music now that i wouldn't have hardly given the time of day like pop music from the 80s and yeah. stuff like that to where i was inundated with it growing up and i couldn't appreciate it where now i can go you know that's a pretty good song that's yeah. a cool melody i, I don't have the nostalgia connected because i was listening to some wild stuff but now i can you know listen to the radio and let 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 men at work ride and just <laughs> really appreciate the craft of it sure and and you know the nuances of of art and music to the to the different frequencies what are they trying to say um i saw somebody post something last week about they didn't like musicians and certain people being political and and we got into a little chit chat about it um because I, I don't mind at all I, I, and i but we started talking about metaphor that if you're over with it, maybe something like Rage Against the Machine, just kind of, you know, there's there's some metaphors in there, but some people are very direct. But when it's, the politics are buried in metaphor, and there's more of an artistic approach that, you know, you're not beating someone over the head with it. You know, like some songs, I was like, I didn't even know that was about, you know, that the school shooting or right. whatever, some heavy thing. I was like, oh, and then you listen to it, and you're like, oh, it's so cool. And I love it when artists bury things mm -hmm. that you kind of have to find. There's a, a uh, one of my favorites is uh, Jason Isbell. He's got a uh, on his record uh, Southeastern. There's a song called uh, Live Oak that's uh, about uh, you know he's he tells a story about uh, like uh, you know burying this woman there and all this like and this is just like crazy story but all really what it's all a metaphor for him dealing with his alcoholism and uh you know and, and bearing it and like you know like he's sober now and he's been sober and like so it's like but on the on the surface it's just this kind of like murder ballad kind of thing and then like you realize like oh there's a lot you know it's an all a giant metaphor for life so that's the the potential beauty of art and right. how we express ourselves right. you know and in, in, in the, the the cliches versus you know deep stuff maybe no one would ever figure out a friend of mine who's a tarot card reader um speaking of poetry you know sylvia plath is a very well-known 
poet and she committed suicide so everyone gravitates towards that but she was into some deep stuff and my friend had figured out that she buried a bunch of mystical tarot stuff in her poetry that no one had ever figured out um Julia Bramer did that. She used to run a local zine called Night Times back in the 90s here in St. Louis. Kind of like a, a different Shane back oh, in the yeah. day, so to speak. Right. Just loved the music and loved the scene and wanted to document it and have everything to do about it. You know, and that podcasts are kind of the new magazines, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? They're audio. Um, but, you know, she found, because her husband, when she died, broke up the orders of certain poems she did. And then somebody re-released him in the correct order. And, she, and my friend is into Sylvia Plath and into tarot. And she's like, this is tarot. And the intellectual community, the, the kind of in, elite, you know, poet people, the, 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 the Plath intellectuals, like totally dismissed what she had done. And I don't know anything about tarot or Sylvia Plath. And it was obviously right there. And I just love the idea of somebody burying things like that and putting right. different levels of their art. Because, I mean, what is art? You know, it's an expression to somehow elicit a response. And when I'm inspired to dig deeper into something of quality, I hope, because um, we don't want to look for you know something too something too deep in a kiss song, but you know, <laughs> right. we, like, to your point, you dig a little deeper and you start thinking sure. about it. And sometimes you you do need to hear from that artist because you won't figure it out. Yeah. But I just love that multi level stuff of art. It just keeps me going and it makes me want to do things like that. Yeah. Like when I'm in a body bag. I mean, there's any number of things that that can mean grief you know death with me it was it was when i used uh, my sculpture teacher gave me a body bag out of the blue one day and he goes i think you'd know what to do with this <laughs> and i'm just like uh, actually i do right and i started coming out of the body bag wearing a diaper for my shows my band we would start like outside down the street or whatever and they would carry me in on a body bag with a percussion uh parade and they'd come and drop me on the dance floor and then hop up on stage and start playing. And then I would, you know, dramatically come out of this body bag in a diaper. And, you know, there's a lot there. It's relatively cliche for symbolism, but they would know that the typewriter idea came from my grandfather's death and that I was reborn through his death. Hence the diaper. So I come out as a baby and I crawl on stage and I start performing. And all that stuff was happening at the same time of my life. Would anybody know that if I didn't tell them? Right. No. But that, who ca- I don't care. As an artist, I didn't care then. Uh, and people just go, oh, that guy's being weird. That's good <laughs> enough for me because I definitely got people's attention. But it, it, the crisscross of, of all those things just utterly fascinate me. And, you know... A simple song can really convey endlessly any number of emotion. And and painting and art is just a different form of music and vice versa. You know, and 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 to see, you know, a painting can speak to you every t- differently every time you look at it, just like a song. And mm-hmm. there's a feeling, and it's very different. So a perfect segue into what I've been trying to do. Uh, artistically through COVID. I let the whole typewriter thing move away from me. Not only was I burned out before all this stuff happened, um, but as it happened, I just let go. And I started getting into throat chanting stuff. And we would integrate that with our shows for some time. We usually begin with throat chanting and stuff like that. And that tends to drone on and can get boring. But... um, Man, I, I just started doing this thing with the Funky Butt guys and, and, and Brennan yeah. England and John Hoistler, a couple of didgeridoo players there, and then uh, Aaron and Adam from the Funky Butt. We, we really throat chant well together. And so we started doing these weird recordings of, of throat chant stuff because I wanted to make music for my massage room, for my yoga classes and stuff. And we, we did this recording session, and it turned out so dark. But it was really cool because it wasn't your typical airy fairy massage stuff. It was like dark. We were all all looking around going, man, this is not pleasant. (laughs) And so we put out this cool record, which I'm going to release 
pretty soon called Cave in the Mountain. I just like that concept of the cave in the mountain, kind of going back to the allegory of the cave and, and those kind of things. Once again, multi layers of metaphors. So then fast forward to, you know, last year. Um, Charlie Serpa produced the Cave in the Mountain stuff and it was like one of his first projects as a producer and he just did such a great job and it was such a weird project but it was perfect for him and then we came back and I wanted to do something with the the chakra tones each each chakra through the body the seven wheels in your body the different colored wheels you know in a simplistic way um, they all have a coinciding frequency and so I was like, you know what? I want to come back to this make a massage CD music. I guess CDs aren't relative anymore. But I wanted to make this tone thing. Um, and we we tried to pluck some stuff out of some of the recordings we had done before and tweak it. But um, that wasn't working. And then Charlie's like, let's just try to have you sing a little bit. So I just had a little bit of a sample. Because the day we recorded, my voice wasn't in a good way. And I only, I think we ended up for like uh, six jams, I think we're, there was like 30 seconds total that he chipped and chopped some of the tones when I nailed it or he, he fixed what I wasn't. Because I, I, my voice only has so much range and certain those frequencies I can't hit. Right. Thank God for auto-tune. Like we're not doing the pop thing with it. We're actually just fixing my tone and putting it in the right frequency. And the whole time I'm kind of working on this, I'm looking at the music industry completely shifting. And I was really concerned with it before the world fell apart. But then as it was falling apart, I'm really scared that people are going to get used to not going to shows because they were slowly not going to shows before. And now that, that we can't, I was really worried. And everyone's like, oh, I think everyone's going to come back and really flood these places. And I'm over here going, I don't think so. I think we're getting used to not only staying home, but I think we're getting used to, to not spending the money that it takes and all the stuff. And I was being a negative ninny and, and, and I was just, you know, looking at worst case scenarios for art and music. And so then I'm like, all right, well, I think I want to change the home listening experience. And at the time, you know, serendipitously, there's all these ads on Facebook and stuff that um, they had these colored light things that you could change the light in your house. And I'm looking at that, and I'm, I'm going, huh. And so I came up with this uh, integrating of the five senses to make a sixth sense, meaning um, we made this record. We made these interesting tones without droning on. A lot of the tone stuff I'd been hearing is one tone for minutes, and it's kind of like meditating to me. It, it, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of uncomfortable. It's like, okay, I'm going to sit down and do nothing. And I've studied it for so long, I, I, I'm more comfortable with that and kind of can clear my head because right. I've practiced a lot at it. But as a meditation teacher, people are looking at me going, it's quiet. What, what am I supposed to think about? And that's legit. And it's like, well, think about nothing. And it's like, what? <laughs> Your brain's always moving. It's always thinking about how do you hold on to nothing? And it would be like, okay, focus on your breath and do all that. That only lasts a couple seconds. And you're like, you, you know, and when you're not used to it, you're like, you feel incompetent. And you are because you're not doing anything. And so I wanted to make something not only where people could, I, I want to trick people into meditating, but um, to change the, the home listening experience. Because I started thinking about vinyl. And I started thinking about record players. When I grew up, you had to put a needle on a record. And I don't want to get all geezer on everybody. <laughs> but it was a ritual. And I've been thinking, I've been studying behavior change pretty intently the last few years. Like, I really want to understand not only what it takes for me to change, but how do you help people, like, achieve their goals and, and not get caught in what they don't want. And so ritual is a part of that. Create a ritual for yourself. You know, they say do something small because I, I got a thousand things I want to change in my life and it gets overwhelming and I don't change a thing. But if I do one little thing a day that changes, I can test it and see, ah, is that working? How does that feel? If I don't drink coffee one day, how does that feel? I don't have to put this big, heavy burden on myself to stop and do this thing because I love me some coffee in the morning, you know, and I, I have a, a thirst for stimulation, no pun intended, but um, putting these things together and creating a ritual 
um, that I connected to when putting Pink Floyd record and how it looked. And I was very present on the artwork. And we've lost that a fair amount in society. So I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and go bigger with it. So we made these tones. And I'm going to make like a home listening kit where it has a light, a light in it that changes color. I just found some at an affordable price, but you never know how these things work over time. Anyway, so this kit's going to have the record. It's going to have instructions. It's going to have something to change the color in your room to do chromotherapy, how color affects our lives. Because if you grow up in a pink room, when you wake up, you're going to have a slightly different vibe than if you wake up in an electric yellow room or a fluorescent orange room. It's going to do something. You'll get used to it, but there's different psychological effects, not only with frequencies of music, but color. And then I'm like, well, well, let's not stop there. Let's integrate smell with it. So I'm going to put candles, scented candles and essential oils in this kit. Yeah. So that when you listen to the root chakra, you put on a red light, you put on this song. You use a certain essential oils and light a certain colored candle that coincides with the chakra. And then I'm going to put seeds cause, or different dried food, then eat. So you're smelling, eating, hearing, and seeing something very different than you're used to. Even if you're sitting in your living room, you changed it to the color red. There's a candle burning in front of you that's red. You're smelling certain smells. You're eating strawberries or something that's red. And you've got these headphones on. And then there's, there's this, you know, this weird tone going on. And you've immersed yourself in your own senses. And then what I've noticed is your brain starts to literally change. And you've created this, this multi-sensory ritual that kind of frees you up from your thought pattern because you're immersed in what you're doing and you're you're literally not just thinking about something you're tasting it you're smelling it you're hearing it you're you're seeing it you're immersed in it and then the part of the goal is to then change the sixth sense in that how do you feel for some people that might be spiritual for some people it might be purely scientific like what am i feeling right now and so um, um, right now I'm just ma waiting on mastering from Brad Sorno. Just, man, he's such good with frequencies. And oh, yeah. there's certain medicine people that I want involved in this thing. Um, and I'm about to hop on a motorcycle and travel around the country. And I'm going to build this kit in New York in a couple weeks. And then build some more in Atlanta now that I'm starting to find an affordable way to do it. And part of it's kind of gimmicky where I don't think it, too many people are going to buy this kit. It's going to have a decent price tag on it because it comes with all this stuff. Right. But I just wanted to, you know, get people thinking differently, like artists thinking, like beyond just burning incense at a show. But what if people had a, a I want to do a bigger scale, like integrative performance art where people come into a bigger room and do this ritual that I'm talking about. And I have a little more control over what people are experiencing, whether that's a wraparound screen someday, because three, 360 video is blowing up right now, and I want to get on that edge to, once again, change the listening, and, and not just the listening experience, but the experience itself. I was talking with um, grief with um, a friend of mine, um, Andrew Franklin's mother, actually, and he passed away, and we were talking about grief and his mom is a medicine woman. I love her so much. And we had a really powerful sit down. And she said something that blew me away. She goes, life is about experiences. And it just floored me. It's a simple statement. It's nothing I didn't know. It's not groundbreaking. But it rooted me in like, you know what? That's real. The experience might be tough. I might walk outside and step on a nail. But, you know. It's hard to find happiness and pain, but sometimes it breaks down to, man, I'm happy I can feel this because if I couldn't feel this pain, I'd be dead by now. And reaching towards enlightenment and what what is enlightenment? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of those really abstract things, but I think it is one of those things where you connect with where you are and we're always there, but our brains seem to be just hell bent on trying to control the future and trying to control the past, which is relatively 
impossible. But theory of relativity says it's all happening at the same time. And what that tells me is be in the moment. Then I can actually start influence, influencing the future and healing the past. Because so much of us on a subconscious level are dragging around our crap. And it's, you know, our parents and these people didn't know any better. They're going by what was done to them. But those things can cause trauma. And that trauma word is pretty incredible, too. It's thrown around a lot, and it usually has to do with really intense stuff. But when you're a kid, and you start reaching for that beautiful blue flame on a stove, and someone smacks your hand, when you're just being curious... That can totally change your life. And you can go from curious to worried about being punished. And then that snowballs into weird stuff. And those, there's nobody that's free from trauma. I don't care how well you lived. Even sometimes living well can be traumatic. Look at Siddhartha becoming the Buddha. I mean, Siddhartha was a, a, a prince. Very elegant lifestyle. Didn't have to lift a finger. And then saw something and wanted to go out and experience the world because Siddhartha knew that the experience he was getting was not the world and went and saw what they call suffering. And, you know, finally, all, after all this journeying, someone goes, oh, you want to be enlightened? Go listen to the river. And it's like, what? <laughs> and it was through that experience of listening to the river that made the Buddha the Buddha. And it is about accepting suffering. But when you accept suffering, you cease to suffer. And uh, my uncle said something near the end of his life that, that just still just blows me away. He said, do not suffer. He goes, we sacrifice. And I just went, ah, oh. takes the little sting off it mm -hmm. and takes the sorrow and the heaviness and goes, you know what? This is empowerment. And what does sacrifice mean? It means to make sacred. And it's like, oh, when you make suffering sacred, you're no longer a victim. You're empowered. And it's not about taking control of it. Quite the opposite. You accept it for what it is, and then you can work with it. And my uncle also said, don't fight with it, nephew. Dance with it. Boom, same stuff. You know, life gets hard, and we can butt heads with it and we can fight it and then it just hurts but if we can accept it then we can start to go okay I, and, and so, it, some some people would say some things are unacceptable and that's accurate but we still have to accept it if we're going to move forward and solve it you know we have to accept racism and i think that's what some people are banging their drum on like hey there's some serious problems out there and i hear the other side that's going no you're making that problem it's like no but if we accept it that our history is treacherous and that human beings are terrible, then we can start to go, okay, well, what are we going to do about it? And that's what like my recent life is teaching me. And I got like through the situation, I don't even like to say the C word. I don't even like to, to call it what it is, you know, but through tough situations, economically and health wise, just, you know, across the, the world taught me these things, not just to stay in the moment and don't take anything for granted, but to accept the situation. And then you can maneuver and pivot and make the adjustment. Because what I define health as the ability to adjust mentally, physically, whatever. And to accept that, you know, society is exposing a lot of its gross parts. And I got so frustrated because, you know, I saw just a lot of frustration and less emphasis on solutions, which is really easy for me to say as a white guy. But, you know, and then I started getting frustrated with what I thought other people were doing. And I was trying to distract myself from how I felt about how I thought I wasn't doing well. And then I got so frustrated. And then I asked myself, what are you going to do about it? And it just hit me because that was a legitimate question. And I really wanted the answer in my head. 
And then I decided to exemplify what I wish everybody in this country and world would do. And that is to connect back up and get back to local business, supporting each other in our own community. And instead of just pointing fingers, engaging as best as possible. And like through this whole, you know, pandemic situation, I was put in a rural situation. I had to go live with my dad out in the woods and surrounded by, uh, how do I say this politely? People with a different perspective on such things as myself. Right. And I was in their world. And I'm like, man, all these people just go to Walmart. And driving around those areas, I would see these old retail strips empty. But the Walmart parking lot was full. Right. And I kept going, we slit our own throats. But in an economic situation, I was forced to shop at Walmart for a little while because I didn't have any loot. And I felt so terrible about that. And then once I got out of there, I'm like so frustrated, not just with myself, but with society. So I'm like, what am I going to do about it? And it's like, well, what was I born to do? And I was like, was I born to cut wood and fix foundations and work concrete and all that? Nothing against all that stuff. I love that stuff. I, you know, I, I love manual labor. I'm not knocking anybody. In fact, through this whole situation, those are the cats that kept their jobs. Right. Where us service industry people were screwed. Anyway, and I just, well, all right, well, here's what you're going to do. I had a vision. And I was like, I'm going to hop on an American motorcycle. And I'm going to go around the country and I'm going to highlight nonprofits, small businesses, what are artists doing to survive? What are musicians doing to survive? I feel like we're losing, and rightfully so, the, 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 the ideals of America. But then I realized if, if that's important to me, I need to do these things. And all these things just fell into place. Through the situation of the pandemic, I just threw up my hands and just said, I'm not, I'm not doing anything anymore. I'm not running my career anymore. I'm not going to try to do anything. You know, I had the spiritual conversation with, with the great mystery, as I call it. Um, and I said, I'm not doing anything. Whatever, you know, that proverbial, what do you want me to do? What's my purpose? And I says, you're going to have to put that literally in my lap. And days later, things started happening. I realized that I can edit video and I needed to stop needing someone else to do that for me. I'm going to do it myself. You know about that. And like days later, my buddy hits me up who owed me a favor and goes, I got a lap. Uh, Mac, MacBook Pro for you. And I'm like, okay, that's a sign. And then a buddy of mine saw that my phone was pretty old and busted up. And he goes out and buys me a big battery phone. He goes, you know, out in the, out in the woods, you're probably going to need this big battery. And I'm just like, wow. And it has been one thing after another. A Harley Davidson motorcycle basically fell on my lap. Nice. I've, I've had to be, buy a few things, but it, you know, that's just safety stuff, but it's just been incredible to do these things and not do them and let life happen. Now, can you just sit in a room and expect someone to always bring you food and think your dream life is going to happen if you don't make any maneuvers for it? Of course not. Mm -hmm. But um, balance, the give and the take to spin it ar back around to these these memorial orbs that I make is that occasionally I would get caught up in what I wanted. I need more money. I need, you know, this or that. I'm scared because my career, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing in a few years when I thought I knew when we don't really know. But a few friends over a few days, you know, asked me and this rarely comes up in conversation and i'm just talking about you know like I, i'm having a hard time and they're like well how are you being of service and i was kind of like what and they're like well how are you being of service and i'm like huh that's interesting and then i started doing daily videos little yoga things to to be of service to at least 
to help people breathe a little deeper, stay hydrated and do their posture. Cause I believe those things are just the basics of health. And if we do those things, we'll see the hospital way less. And we won't have a lot of the problems that we have if people focus on self care. Um, but it's kind of funny as human beings, we just grossly ignore the basic stuff that works and we'll gravitate towards hyperbole drama. That is just a lot of it's just manipulative wheel spinning. I call it like, you know, I get it. Journalism has changed. These people are fighting for their jobs and the only way they can keep their job is to be dramatic. If it bleeds, it leads, you know, and it's funny through this process, you know, sex sells, but, uh, there's not a lot of sex being sold right now. Because we have other priorities that supersede pleasure. But all these things come back together. And what I really love about doing the glass things is, is I can be of service. Beyond just entertaining or being weird and making people go, wow, that's weird. That guy's <laughs> out there. But, I, you know, that, that I can provide a service that people really appreciate. And that I can get um, paid for it. And it's not like a negotiation. I'm not trying to manipulate money out of anybody. It's just a legitimate price for a legitimate service. And everybody wins. Everybody's so happy um, in that way. And to tie all that together in connection and then to literally have an object, a circular orb that has somebody's remnants in it. Their DNA is in this magic glass. And glass is just an amazing medium. It's a, uh, there's a local person here in St. Louis, a, a master painter, uh, Phil Jarvis. He's just... Oh, yeah. He is just... I'm big fan. Yeah. Um, I was at Venice Cafe one time, and the owner of Venice Cafe said, you know, Phil's as good as any artist in history. And I was like... Nuh uh and he goes, look a little closer at his work. And so I did a deep dive into his paintings and, and not just his sign paintings and what he chooses to paint and stuff like that. And was like, you know what? This dude is as good as anybody in history. Not not only is he a cool guy and a humble guy, just amazing artist, mm -hmm. but his work speaks. And he told me, and he would know, he goes, nothing reflects color like glass. Nothing. And I thought about that. And I was like, you know what? That is right. It It is a magic substance um, that... Still, I've been working with glass for over 15 years, um, and I still am memorized even by the most simplest part of that whole process. Yeah, it's incredible. Are you, uh, what, what when did the uh, like you realize that these orbs like are something that you could do? Like, when when is that idea? Because I know I've also seen some of you, you've incorporated the, like the, the typewriter keys yep. in your sculptures and different things. Yeah, we were doing that and we were wrapping glass around metal typewriter parts, which at the time, 15 years ago, I was one of the few artists in the world that was intentionally putting glass with metal because it doesn't work. If they're touching, in the annealing process, which is a oven that brings the temperature down slowly over time, because if glass cools too quickly or crack, it needs to, and, and that has to do with the outsides cooling at a way different temperature than the inside, and that creates tension in the glass, and it'll crack. But the annealer kind of soaks it in heat so it can have an even heat from the skin to the center so it doesn't crack. But through that process, if metals touching glass, they start to, to, to create more tension. Right. I used to think it was the metal leaching the heat out of it, but it's just a surface tension that happens um, because they're just different materials. So we were wrapping and, and pouring glass around typewriters to different degrees with experiments and stuff. And... I was thinking this morning, leading into this interview, I can't remember who asked about that first. Because where we do the glass locally, um, they didn't really want it happening there. Because it's kind of weird. You know, there's there's people's DNA and cremains are in the area. Um, and, and that makes people uncomfortable. And I get it. Um, but they let us do it. I can't remember the first person to ask me about that. And my glass partner, Aaron, he didn't want to do it. It's kind of creepy and it's kind of gross. The dust gets in the air. And so it's kind of creepy that 
every one that I've done, their DNA is in my body because <laughs> right. it gets in your eyes, it gets in your mouth, your nose, your ears. Um, and, you know, glass powder does that as well. And we joke in the studio that once it goes in, don't come out. <laughs> and so, you know, and that's part of why we charge what we do is because yeah. all that stuff goes into it. Like my partner, you know, the, the, when we started getting into it more of as a business, he just tapped on his chest one time and goes, my lungs hurt. And I went, ooh, yeah, we should probably be, be <laughs> using breathers. Right. Yeah. Uh, we don't, but I don't mind. It really doesn't bother me. If I'll breathe glass dust, I'm not scared about someone's ashes. And it, it, you know, it becomes a part of me. Yeah. Like, um, I saw a picture of somebody, like when Mr. Bungle got back together, somebody took a whole bag of, of cremains and threw it on stage. And they had pictures of like this streak. And there's this giant bag of um, cremains that poof went around the stage and anybody that posted anything about it like nationally consequence of sound and all this stuff i'd always post like well your buddy wanted to be a part of the band now he literally is yeah. i would be so upset if someone made that choice for me because people don't realize you know that's bone dust what's left over mm -hmm. and you know i choose to breathe it <laughs> and work with it but man, you can't make that decision sure. for somebody else. I bet that drummer in that band's pretty upset because it seemed to hit around him. Yeah. Now, is it going to do anything bad to you? No, you know, might affect some people, but but it's just a fascinating process. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember who first did it, and once we started doing it, people were so touched by it. We kept getting more referrals and more referrals. I'm trying to trying to leave town really soon, and I keep getting orders. Nice. So my bike keeps getting delayed at the shop, getting ready for this big journey. But um, I keep getting orders in, and I can't stop because I know what the experience is for everybody involved. Yeah. You just did a, a your first, uh, first one for a turtle, you said, the other day? We did a turtle the yeah. other day. Yeah. And, and we did, like, the time before that, we did an infant. And that really blew my mind. Because most people you, in pets, pets are smaller, obviously, but... Man, to pull out just tiny little baggie with mm -hmm. just a little in there really, really got in my head. And that was heavy. They're all incredible experiences. I don't care if it's a turtle or whatever. Like, right. it's, it's a very, very powerful situation. But knowing it was an infant yeah, that's blew tough. my mind. And I was touched by a turtle. I, and... and and part of it's a mind job. I just thought these people love this turtle so much. You know, and certain animals, I, after living out in the woods, I, I, I care less about a squirrel or a rabbit because there's a gazillion of them. But, you know, these people loved, and they told me the story of the turtle. You know, it was a rescue. It was, it was dying. And this woman's husband nursed it back and... Um, it was an albino, so it was going to have a harder time out in, I think it was old and albino out in the woods and it, it, the scales, you know, on its shell were falling off. Thing was just busted down and they sent me pictures and, and all that kind of stuff. And it really, really changed the experience, Yeah, you know, and it, it's fascinating. And the love people bring to the scenario is really what touches me, you know, and man, it's just, it's just mind blowing and, and. You know, it's just like work. Some days are smooth and some days are tough. But every time we do these cremains, it's smooth. Mm -hmm. It feels like something else is doing it. That could be my brain just filling in the gaps or making it seem more grandiose or whatever. But pff, I don't think so. These things, I've been in a lot of ceremonies and a lot of heavy spiritual situations. And I've seen this stuff kind of happen where it's like, man, my hands aren't doing this. And musicians can speak to that. And I think music is this incredible spiritual experience where musicians will tell you when they're in the zone, they're not telling their fingers what to move. And their fingers aren't necessarily doing the exact stuff they practice. Like it's almost like a phantom that comes in and takes over. And that's when the hair starts going up. And, right. even what, and the audience picks up on that. I mean, I, I've been in some jams that yeah, yeah. you cannot write a song to get to where we went. And to hear my buddy Chan Evans and Dave Black going toe-to-toe -to -toe 
smoked what I heard Hendrix do with these two guys. I was there, and of course that makes it feel, but it's just like, man, there's something else going on. Yeah, I respect atheists as much as anybody. I get it. I can believe in quantum physics just as much as I believe in the great mystery, but I'm sorry. I've experienced too much of this stuff that is what I put in magic or impossible. Sure. I've experienced too much of it to be like, yeah, whatever, there's nothing out there. <laughs> And I do believe that um, that when we die, you know, we don't keep together, so to speak. I look at it like a drop of blood in the ocean. That when that blood hits the water, that blood never dis- disappears. The matter that's in that drop of blood does not ever disappear. It just gets so spread out in the ocean that it's not that drop of blood anymore. Right. That drop of blood fuels something else, which fuels something else. Um, I'm starting to get more into reincarnation. Mm-hmm. You know, I heard about it and was like, yeah, whatever. And now I'm 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 hearing about certain people's like experiences and what some of these mediums are reading in these people and how I feel. Yeah. Whoa. What? I don't know. I'll never pretend to know, but I think there's something to it. For sure. There's a lot of, I mean, it's in, definitely interesting to think about some yeah, of the stuff. Right. There's, there's, uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, unexplainable things. Uh, even, uh, I mean, I don't know about reincarnation necessarily, but just the way how perfect things kind of come together sometimes. Like, even thinking about all this, like, I, I also lost uh a pup to uh, cancer uh, seven years ago, mm. and uh, you know it was one of those kind of things where it was really tough. And a lot of people like afterwards were like, you know, I sent me links to like different adoption and foster things or whatever. And they were, and I'm like, I'm not really like looking to just replace my dog, and right. you know, it wasn't like that. Like, and um, and then I get a call from my vet, so, and. And of course, they knew the whole story, but they, somebody had, uh, according to what they told me, this a man, a man brought a puppy in there, and that somebody dumped a puppy in his yard, mm. and he's like, well, you know, I didn't really know what to do, so he brought it to the vet, and then, so, um, so we get a, she was a uh, she pit boxer mix. We 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 guess we don't we don't we don't have any idea, but sure. we uh they were like, well, somebody dumped this puppy up here, and she mm. needs a home, and we well, we thought of you guys. So it was like it was just like one of those kind of things too. Like it all just kind of like felt right, like especially when your vet like believes in you as a dog owner and like and all this stuff. But it was just like a weird, uh, you know, it was really comforting, I guess, you know, in a sense, like it felt like uh, this just felt right, you know, especially like something tells us like this dog belongs here and and then we took her home and she's been incredible but it's just like it was really just a, a beautiful moment you know like we all everything that like, came together like that so we in our family and i'm sure everybody has a lot of people have this experience that anytime we go get a pet it never worked out you know like I, we went and got my mom this hound and it was just the worst dog for her and we went out of our way, you know, she she loved the dog, but it was not a good mix. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I worked my network to find the absolute perfect scenario. This dog would not stop barking. Yeah. I mean, it was it was tough. Sure. I, the dog was cute and awesome, but just and it would it would get into these situations where it couldn't stop barking. Hours later, this thing is and it was like, whoa, my mom was losing sleep and it just wasn't good. Man, I ended up finding the perfect owner for this particular dog. She still loves this dog, sends me pictures of it still. Yeah. And then a dog almost literally falls in my mom's lap where, you know, my niece's roommate was a, was a punk and moved out and left the dog. This dog is perfect for my mom. Okay. He actually saved my mom's life. I don't think she was doing too well. And this dog came into her life. And it's, it's one of those dogs where you, the dog's facing the other way, doing nothing, and you just melt. The dog is like beyond cute. It's incredible. Um, snuggled with him this morning. <laughs> but, you know, to that point, like when, when, when we don't open the door, when the door is open for us, that's right. a spiritual thing in my 
you know, however I look at it. Yeah. That going back to me surrendering and letting spirit do everything. I tried so hard to push my music career and my art career. And the harder I pushed, the less people showed up and the less sales I had. And now I'm doing decent business and, 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 and making things happen in ways I never thought. And the doors are opening and it's just a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. The timing is right. And we don't know what we're being saved from or set up for. We want to control everything. It's natural because we you can't just breeze it. But what a fascinating scenario! And I think pets are that very same way. You go out after it, it doesn't work. But when someone goes, "Hey, man, this chicken just showed up on my porch," boom! I mean, that you know, is that God talking? I don't know. Is that just random stuff? Maybe I don't think so because you hear it too much, like the zodiac. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe that when I was born or what planet is going on has <laughs> something to do with my stuff. Man, the heck if that's not accurate. I mean, I don't care what you believe. You can't right. tell me that's the, that some of those personality traits. How, how how in the world does that have to do on what day and time you were born? Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> But I think there's things in this world to remind us. N- not in detail. You don't have to know that the House of Aquarius does blah, blah, blah. You know. Uh. <laughs> but I think there's things out there that just give us signs. To just, if nothing else, I don't, I don't know why, to tell you the truth. Yeah. I don't know why this is the way it is. I don't know why I was born. I'm not going to leave this. Maybe I, my goal is to leave this planet better than I found it. Yeah, man. But I produce a bunch of waste. And I, how do you circumvent that, you know, on everything I've taken from this planet, even just as an individual? How do I give that back? How many trees have I cut down? How do I give that back? How much gas have I burned up? Uh, what? <laughs> you know, and but I think that that's my goal. I'm not projecting my goals on anyone else anymore, but mm-hmm. that's mine is, is to achieve. How do I leave this place better than I found it? Bur- bur- doing what I do. And uh, does that mean inspiring children? You know, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. You know, philosophically, we can make the world better than we found it. But on a real sense, how do I offset the things I've taken from this world? Right. Uh, and you, know, you can't beat yourself up over that, you know. But, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, create vibrations, create colors, move some stuff around. I like the old thing. I hear this. <laughs> People, this is really as a human being, all you're doing is moving stuff around your entire life, and it really doesn't amount to anything, you know. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're moving ideas around, we're moving things around, and in two generations, ain't hardly no one gonna remember you. They ain't yeah. gonna remember what you did. You're gonna be a name on this. I look at my family tree, and it's like, I enjoy thinking about these people. Yeah, I went weird. To, I used to one of my first jobs. I worked at uh, Schnucks uh, bagging groceries. Yeah, man. And uh, I remember uh, it still sticks with me today. But dude, the, that's a classic job. Yeah, like, for sure. Like my buddy met Steve Ewing from the Urge bagging groceries at a Schnucks. There that's how I found the Urge, and yeah. the Urge is my jams. Oh yeah, you know. So I'm working there, and you know, of course, you know, do my job bagging groceries. And this lady comes in, and uh, you know, she's got a cart full of stuff. She looks at the, looks at the, you know, belt with the. Grocery, she looks at the, you know, whatever price tag, 100 bucks or whatever. She looks at that and she's like, well, it's all going to turn to shit anyway. So and I was just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so I was just like. Uh, that's, that's yeah. And, and you know, that's kind of an existential way to look at right. it. But it's, I, I, I'm pushing lately a big time it is balance. You know, balancing that out. Are we of service? But we can't just be of service because then we can't do it. It's unsustainable. If we give too much away, then we don't have anything. And that was a big part of my year last year was being in nature and being in the moment where I could walk outside and go, oh, what a pretty flower. And within inches, something was dead. Something, you know, and and I'll be like, oh, what a cute little thing. And here comes a hawk, snatches that. Right. mouse and i'm like well that's not fair to the mouse we talk to the mouse that's not fair but nature is brutal but it's also the most gorgeous thing there is right and yeah it goes to shit and and what grows out of that shit 
that's where the nutrients go back into the earth and yep. you don't want to smell it you don't want to deal with it <laughs> right. but the heck if i wasn't looking for cow shit to 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 fertilize the garden you know and then it's kind of like you know like when we was talking i was talking to my dad that this dude <laughs> recycled human shit for his garden and no one wanted to eat his vegetables and stuff because they're like nah that's too close all right and apparently you know that's that was the jams he had an incredible harvest <laughs> And then I was like, yeah, do I want to eat that? Yeah. And then I'm like, well, sure. <laughs> you know, it's been, you know, it's been repurposed and changed. But going back to that blood in the ocean thing, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just, you know, we're going to return to that. Yeah. You yeah. know. Uh, well, you, uh, so we're getting pretty close to uh, you heading out on your adventure and uh, the motorcycle uh, you got the cameras, you got the computer. We're, yep. we're gonna we're gonna make a run at this thing and uh, and really uh, get out there and showcase some of these. Uh, uh, but uh, I guess to keep up with your adventures, uh, follow along on online and stuff. Or? Yeah, like I'm in a weird place right now, kind of going back to that. You know, I'm not doing anything until the time is right. Mm-hmm. So I would love to spit like my website and stuff right now. But I just did a photo shoot yesterday, and I have another one set up that it's hard for me to make press photos until I have my motorcycle. Right. And I did a photo shoot yesterday. I was terrible. I'm so not a model. (laughs) I'm so not a poser. It was so uncomfortable, and it was so weird. And I know that came through and reflecting with it and talking with Virginia a little bit, Virginia Harold, who's the most brilliant photographer you could ever come across, Virginia Harold. Man, I can't say enough of good things. Kind of, kind of to that uh, Phil Jarvis thing. Mm-hmm. She's as good as any photographer in history. And she has just, uh, she's a medicine woman, and she just has a way of capturing, like, reality and life. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I was real stiff. And off my game yesterday and realized that I need to be photographed doing things. Anyway, um, yeah, so the website's kind of waiting for photographs. Because all the photographs I've had from before are all about music and art. Right. And those are a part of where I'm going, but they're not the, the, the push. So I need a little more stuff on me. So I'm building all that stuff as we speak. But, you know, search for typewriter Tim and these things will, will, will come up. I'll come up and those things will definitely be coming up as time goes on. Yeah, man. Um, and right now, I, I always have to be careful because I, my brain goes a million different places like a lot of artists and people. Um, so I have to be careful what I commit to. Is it going to be typewriter Tim? I'm not, I'm not typewriter Tim so much anymore. Typewriter Tim is my uh, sounds kind of weird, but. Um, like my personality is splitting into different personalities Mm -hmm. to where, you know, there's the yoga teacher, there's the massage cat, there's typewriter, Tim, there's type Jordan, which is different than type typewriter, Tim. And so as I, these things kind of come together and also come apart at this time, um, I've got to see how the media kind of starts building itself. And I have to be careful because whatever I commit to now is going to be how it is. So, uh, and I don't even know if typejordan.com is available anymore. But, you know, that's the beauty of today. I don't think anyone looks up stuff. They usually just run a search. So right. Run a search on typewriter, Tim. Yeah. Or kook ball riding his motorcycle around <laughs> the country. Um, but, yeah, I'm just waiting for the bike and then taking the cameras. Um, and I'm just going to be documenting all that i'm going to be documenting doing the website i'm going to document you know getting my audio gear ready because i'm going to get into podcasting such as yourself and and i want to be a documentarian of america and what i love about america so luckily i'm heading to the east coast i've got a kind of a pseudo residency at a uh, art gallery in frenchtown um new jersey and um, she's going to let me live there, but I'm also going to do performance art there because I kind of don't have a job. And it's like, what else am I going to do? Being on media is my job. So I'm going to roll around in her gallery in the body bag <laughs> when there's no one in it. And when there's someone in it, I'm going to retreat and I'm going to put a 360 camera on the ceiling or something like that so people can live stream and kind of see where it's going to be. Um I'll be on YouTube, typewriter Tim on YouTube. Um, and coincidentally, I found another typewriter Tim. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The friend suggestions on Instagram. <laughs> huh? I saw a typewriter Tim one. Huh. And so I emailed him. I'm like, you don't play a typewriter, do you? 
And uh, he's like, no, I collect them. I'm like, okay, cool. Because <laughs> I always joke that if I found another sure. typewriter player, we would battle. And whoever won yeah. gets to keep going. And whoever loses has to stop. <laughs> so luckily, typewriter Tim in Chicago doesn't play a typewriter or I'd have to go battle that guy. <laughs> um, and I'm actually probably going to give him typewriters at some yeah. point because I'm trying go. to unload my hundreds and hundreds of typewriter because all of a sudden I'm not going to make as much sculpture out of them mm -hmm. as I see it. Uh, and I, I moved out of the house I was living in and they're heavy. <laughs> And I've got a lot of them. I mean, I literally, I mean, I, I scrapped at one point, I scrapped um, almost about almost 900 pounds of typewriters. Whoa. I got like 25 bucks for that stuff. Yeah. I was bummed about that. I thought I was going to get more. But, and those were just my electric ones that didn't look very good and didn't have too much of my purposes. I kept most of my old iron ones and, and most of them, but it's kind of funny that people ask me for typewriters and like none of mine work. None of them. They're all either in disrepair or just gummed up from rust. But anyway, so yeah, I'm I'm heading to, to the East Coast. Um, I want to see New York for the first time, and I want to ride through while I can because traffic is, is more sparse now to where my buddy's like, you need to come here. Because originally I was going to document American music, jazz, country, rock and roll, the blues, and how that all came to be in America. Um, and then I got, that was a too big of a project for me, but that's what I was going to go for. And then my buddy goes, you need to come to New York now. It's empty. It's going back a couple months. And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I need that footage. So I shifted gears and I'm going to the East coast. Um, I'm going to run up on some of my artist friends. I have a proposal that I worked with, worked on before with one of my buddies clip from the p-funk all-stars um i was talking to him he had and i had the bass player from fishbone norwood agree to work with me um and what i was going to do was put together this crazy jazz funk band and raise uh equipment for east st louis schools in the honor of miles davis and bitches brew his his dope improvisational record and the guys from bad brain said they'd do it norwood was in we were just going to start talking to stephen perkins from jane's addiction and everything was a go and then i had no budget for it so things had to stop but as things are right now i'm going to pick that project back up so probably tomorrow i'm going to call clip because all the bad brains guys outside of hr live in woodstock so i'm going to go to woodstock and I can do this. I can just ride up there and try to talk to these cats. And now I can just we can just wave a little money and artists need gigs. So okay. I'm like, hey, you know, can you guys do this? And so uh, I'm going to see what they say. I don't care anymore. Right. What are you going to say? No. And these people aren't doing as much. You know, if I tried to run up on 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 these people, you know, five years ago, they got stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. They're they're playing gigs, they're making records, they're doing whatever they need to do. Where now, even still, it's like, no, we got some time and right. we need some money. So I'm gonna go after um, my acquaintance speech from Arrested Development in Atlanta. I'm gonna try to roll up on him. I went over to his house one time when I lived in Atlanta. He invited me over. I. Just uh, He produced a uh, Citizen King's record, and I was really good friends with those guys and loved their music. And then Speech was in Atlanta, and, and he came in the restaurant. I was waiting tables in. So I walked up to his table singing one of the songs he produced. And he's like, hey, uh -uh. how do you know this song? And I was like, yo, those are friends of mine. And so we hit it off. And he goes, hey, man, I got this church where it's for artists and musicians and stuff. You want to check it out? And I was kind of like, eh know about that but i was like hey someone invites me somewhere if i can go usually i'll go or at right. least i was at that zone i feel like artists are more accessible right now and there's a you know i can't call him a buddy but i'm a fan of the old band 24 7 spies and jimmy hazel is in new york and i always watch him on facebook and see he's just really nice guy like wish me happy birthday and you know you hear from your music heroes from your youth and they wish you ha like rude boy from uh urban dance squad you know took a moment to say happy birthday to me and i was just like touched by that stuff yeah, so i'm like i'm just gonna run up on these people and i wasn't gonna take my typewriter with me just because, I don't know, I was burned out and I I'm I'm just don't want to play the typewriter anymore. But the typewriter works and it's really a part of who I am. So then I'm just going to take my player typewriter with me. It's 
small, lightweight, and cool. And I'm just going to roll up on these people and email them, hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And see if Jimmy Hazel will just bring an acoustic guitar down the steps for five minutes. And I'm going to pull up on my motorcycle. And me and him are just going to have a jam for just a little bit. You know, pound, you know, fists or whatever. And then whatever goes on from there. Right. And I think now more than ever, artists are like, yeah, sure. I'll be right down. (laughs) Right. You know? I'm not trying to exploit them or try to get any free music off them or whatever. It's just kind of like whatever. And, you know, those are the kind of moments of life where we just get out of our own way and go, yeah, there's no reason why I wouldn't go down the steps today or down the elevator to play typewriter with this kook ball rolling around the country. (laughs) Why not? And if we can help each other out, uh, you know, cool. And I'm on a tear. I feel bad because I played music for a really long time. And most of my bands were mostly white. And I look back and was reflecting last year on things. And I'm like, you know what? I I wish I would have made a greater effort to have different kinds of people in my band. And St. Louis is a fascinating place in that realm where... You know, the, the, the redlining and physical divide is not the only divide in this city, you know. And I'm like, man, I, I wish I would have played with this person or that person. But, you know, you kind of just deal with whoever's in your zone. And I have a weird way of booking the musicians in my band where it's kind of like I'll work with a certain guitar player until they can't make it. And then I'll work with a, a different guitar player until they can't make it. Right. And, you know, some people make an effort to make it all the time. And, you know, some people, you got a better paying gig. Yes, please go do that. Cause <laughs> I, I can't pay you much because my bands are notoriously huge. Um, so I was like, all right, well, then just do that then. And so as I leave, as I'm working out some of my gear issues and my motorcycle issues, I'm going to start here in St. Louis and start rolling around and talking to people. And I want to flip the script a little bit where if like 80% of the country or this region or whatever is white, I'm going to flip the script and do 80% non-white. And uh, I've been watching a lot of or listening to a lot of conservative backlash on what society's trying to do. And these, this, the, the quote right side is, is, is trying to say, Oh, it wasn't racism until you people started complaining about it. And it's like, no, but how do I circumvent that? And and so I'm just going to make an effort. And we were talking when you were setting up. I'm going to start my own podcast. And it's called Honky's Got a Honk. And it's about not only how white people are in this country. And in parentheses, you know, Honky's Got a Honk. And it's like, how to be a good white person. Because I hear on this conservative stuff that people go, well, what do you want? What does it look like when we find racial unity? And, and I'm like, it's when we listen. And that we is a big we. That's not just white people. Right. And I was really touched by something I heard from a couple Native American writers that were writing this article together. And they said, can you people just please put the stereotypes aside, good or bad, and just listen to our stories? And I was so struck by that, the power of listening. Now, I joke with you, I'm the guy who can't shut up. You probably tell, (laughs) listen to this, this guy, this guy can talk. But part of Honky's Got a Honk is that. I always have to talk. And when I'm uncomfortable, I have to try to control that and talk over that and try to just just try to, you know, do whatever games I need to do to not feel comfortable. And what I've really learned lately is listen. You want people to listen to you, that's why you talk. But we need to listen. And I I explained to to some of my knucklehead white people on some of these concepts. Where, you know, I'm like, well, when were you listening? Because we're, we're quick to talk. That's that honky's got to honk. We have to honk. And like honky, the word honky, you know, I, it came to me through George Jefferson. But it was explained to me. It wasn't honky tonk, which is where that comes from. It was someone explained it to me on how white people, and it's not just white people, have to honk their horns. Oh, yeah. That, that we're impatient right. and we think we're important, that we need to honk our horns to get people out of our way. And I was struck by that metaphor. That's what I thought honky meant for decades until I looked it up and was like, what actually does that mean? Because I was explaining to people, you know, whip cracker. That's what, cr- you know, cracker comes from. But it also has other roots. 
And I was like, you know, honky's got a honk. I'm like, I like the idea of being forthwith about how, quote, we are and that we always have to honk our horns and those kind of things. And I want to tie that in. And I also want to empower people. And I also want my people, my white people to listen to other people's perspective on how to be a good white person. And a lot of it boils down to be quiet and listen. You know, different people have different attitudes about how to make this right because our history is treacherous. And I don't want to whitewash it, so to speak, by saying, well, the natives all fought and whatever tribe had whatever land, they took it from someone else, which is a legit point. But it also negates the personal situations that people have. And I was explaining it to my one buddy the other day because he brought up the whole all lives matter thing. And I'm like, dude, if you went up to someone and said, I have cancer. And their response was, well, a lot of people get cancer. A lot of people, you know, blah, blah, blah. you just totally negated where that person's coming from and what they want. They want healing. Right. And when people say, man, I'm tired of this history and I'm tired of these things happening. Number one, if you just negate it, you didn't listen. You didn't learn. And no one's going, okay, well, what should we really do to make it better? Some people are. But, you know. It gets lost in in the mire, and and you know I want to create better media, as do you. At a time where media is getting worse, and I can't be mad at a journalist for trying to save their job, and if they they can save their job by doing sensationalized things, uh, yeah, you're trying to save your job. I remember I saw a um, the youth minister of the Nation of Islam did a speech at KU. University of Kansas when I was there and he broke it all down. I was blown away. He goes, you take care of your family first, right? If some, if the fit hit the Shan, you'd protect your family first, right? And it's like, yeah. And then it's like, well, who's after that? Well, your secondary family and then your friends and then your acquaintances and then strangers you think are cool. And he broke it down like that. And I was like, you know what? That is right. He goes, I'm not mad at you white feet people for all this. He goes, you're just protecting your family. He goes, yeah, but you take it too far and, and people get hurt. That's a different story. But, you know, that breakdown was really powerful. And then it's just like, all right, well, what am I going to do about it? But if, you know, I don't want to be another white guy exploiting other cultures or exploiting someone's situation to better myself. But that's the beauty of media. It's whatever you want. And I want to create good media at a time where I, I, I'm hoping people are thirsty for better media. Because coming out of this Trump stuff, um, pro or against, it's a mess. I lost a lot of respect for people left and right through that whole experience and that mental civil war that's going on. And it's like, all right, well, how, how do I be a good white person? I'm going to go explore that. And I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to be a good white person. I want to ask these people who I respect, what what is that... How can I be a better white person? Mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated by that subject. And I don't think we're asking each other good enough questions now. I think we're reacting to situations, powerless situations. And that's natural. But I'd like to see... And people talk about dialogue and conversation. I'm like, that's important. But what, what does that look like in actual action? You know, how many people are going to nonprofits that actually do work in justice? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're caught in, oh, that person did that, and that sucks. We need to shame them and do all the things, which is legit. But it's like, all right, well, then what? You know, and then some people are like, well, the justice system is the one that created all this mess. It's like, yeah, all right. You know, how do we fix that? Ah! And I realized that most people, including myself, aren't going to do a ding-dong thing. <laughs> and then I went, well, that ain't good enough for me. How do I combine who I am, what I do to that goal? Going back to what we were discussing earlier. How do you leave this place better than you found it? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I've come across some bigots at my time out in the woods with my dad. And I could have just went, get out of here with that knucklehead bullshit. But I actually engaged them and just kept asking them a simple question. Why do you care? Why did you bring this up? You know, because a couple cats wanted to talk to me about race. I'm like... You're out in the middle of Whiteyville. Why are you bringing this up? Mm -hmm. I go, you've been watching Fox News again, haven't you? <laughs> you know, and, and I'm like, why, why do you care? And they would never answer the question. Right. And I go, what, what's, what, why are we talking about this? I go, I don't know why you're talking 
to me about it because it's obvious how I feel about it. But sometimes there's an opportunity to unwind that crap because I had a buddy early on. I dropped an N-bomb in the car with a black guy. And he's like, er, I mean, car got quiet. Now, he doesn't remember this. And maybe my memory skewed and grandiose. But he goes, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I just shooting off my mouth. He's like, yeah, I know that. But I want to know where that came from. And I was just like, whoa. And I kept trying to apologize my way out of it. Oh, I'm stupid. You know, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I ain't talking about that. What did you actually mean by that statement? Let alone saying it in a, a car with a black guy, you fool. And I was sitting there going, I'm about to get my ass beat. And I deserve it. And he goes, you can either get out of this car or you can tell me what you meant by that. And I just went, you know what, man? My dad's a bigot. I grew up around bigoted people. I'm ashamed. And he just goes, fair enough. You say that shit again, I'm going to beat the fuck out of you. <laughs> All right. He's one of my best friends still to this day. Yeah. That moment changed my life because I went home and I'm like, your mama raised you better than that. That ain't who you are. Mm -hmm. And then I could start to unpack how we pick up stuff and how that actually caused me trauma. You know, I'm not going to compare it to other people's real trauma. It's some privileged white people shit right there. <laughs> but I reflected and I go, that ain't me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that person. That person sucks. Is that who I am? No. And so after that, I use that experience to engage someone who will listen. Some people won't listen. Some of these knuckleheads, I'm not going to waste my time. It's not going to do any good. And those knuckleheads that I dealt with not too long ago out in Owensville on these conversations, did they become really great cultural diverse people because of a conversation with me? No. I had the time. And I wanted to make them look stupid. But I can relate. Because I was, not quite to that extent, I was that dumbass a long time ago. I just shoot off my mouth. Gay this, fag, all that shit. was all socially acceptable when I grew up. And now I look back and I'm like, man, who's that? Because right. that ain't me. Right. So we grow. Can we connect? Once again, I love music. and sp I'm not a sports guy. But what I love about sports is... People who play sports don't care about that stuff anymore because they're in the locker rooms with their and they become brothers or sisters or whoever and friends and loved ones. And that's when it changes. Music, music's the same way. We're a little polarized here in St. Louis in, in so many ways and in the music scene, which makes me kind of sad. But whatever, I'm going to embody that. I'm going to bring together you know people to play with of, of all backgrounds. Um, native music fascinates me. I want to find the roots to that and, and listen to the stories of that. Um, but but to go through those processes of connection. Can we bring these people in? Who are we frustrated with? We're frustrated with a bunch of jerks. Okay, well, how do we motivate those jerks to not be jerks? Well, we can segregate them and go just get out of here, shame them down, so they're going to go out in the woods and train <laughs> and get together with a bunch of other knuckleheads, or we can engage and earn respect. Like I said, some people are beyond that. But some people might be able to be reached and, you know, black people and, and natives and, and di people of different cultures have to deal with that stuff day in and day out and they don't choose to do it. So I feel like it's part of my duty as a good hunk, hunk and honky <laughs> to, uh, you know, work with it and yeah. try to do something and connect people, inspire them to be better and like. With everything going on now, everybody wants to control what scares them and, and powerlessness. It's natural. When we feel powerless, we'll take control in any way, shape, or form. But uh, I was talking to Virginia, uh, waiting in line to get our COVID shot. And I was like, we can, what was it? We can uh, motivate, inspire, or we have to let it go. And it's like, man, you know, mandates and stuff like that are tricky. In one hand, people are so stupid. That they need to be told what to do. They had to mandate seatbelts. You shouldn't have to mandate seatbelts. It should be just like, hello. And, it, and people still resent that. But, you know, I was talking with another friend who was frustrated by mandates yesterday. And it's like, how much is a life worth? How much is an extra day with someone you love worth? 
I go, talk to me about how one more week with my mom would mean to me when we're talking about careless behavior. Now, is my answer to mandate that? Mine isn't. But I'm not mad at anyone who goes, people are stupid. We have to mandate or they won't get it. I would have liked to have seen something else happen. Like back in the day, big campaigns of be smart, you know, or donate rubber. Don't, you know, don't use this. Give it for the cause of world war, whatever. We've lost that. We've lost it for the fight hyperbole of journalism and the 24-hour news cycle. And then the social media, what that did to the 24-hour news cycle is like, man, whoa, whoa, whoa. We should be evolving better. But once again, if I have that, what am I doing? Mm. Right. You know, I got to go out there and I got to go live my life and make something of myself. And hopping on a motorcycle is my way of doing it. Because I do a million different things in my business. I was getting some business counsel. And they're like, dude, you have to pick one thing. And I'm like, <laughs> you don't understand. All right. And then I just immediately went, video. And my friend goes, Exactly. Then you can do all that stuff as long as there's a video camera there. You're still falling into your business plan. Going back to what we were talking about, balance. That I can't just be an artist and expect, oh, a manager's going to show up, a documentarian's going to show up, and then your fans are going to show up. It, it, it works that way for some, usually more in history than now. But it's like, no. You got you to gotta do the business. And I've been fighting that forever. And now I'm more apt to do the business and the balance part of that, to hold a business plan, making a plan instead of just making stuff, making music, making records. Because we as artists can, a lot of times we make something and then we're done with it. And like, I'll make a record right. and then not touch it. But I'm about to release all that stuff real soon. To just because, and I don't care anymore. It's not for my career anymore. It's just like, well, I made this stuff. I want to get it out now. It's just I was avoiding the work part of it, the business part of it, because I'm an artist. I just make stuff. It's someone else's job to do these things. Yeah, and it is, but it's not. I'm not that lucky. I don't. I don't. I don't know those people. I don't have those resources. So now I finally got out of my own way. I said, handle your business as well. And get out there and do it. And if it doesn't work, if I get to Indiana and that bike breaks down, I can just hitchhike back here and start <laughs> doing foundations again. All right. I know it's not going to go that way, but I have no fear. I'm going into the abyss, so to speak. But I also have faith that my friends won't let me fail. Yeah. And that's real. Yeah, man. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what uh, where this journey takes you, man. I see what's next for for Tim and uh, get a, uh, hopefully this music coming out soon and everything else. So we got a lot of things happening, and um, but I'm just uh, I'm I'm proud to call you friend and be a part of this with you, man. So and you know how I feel about you, Shane. I'll yeah. go on for another two hours <laughs> on how what cool cat you are and what you're doing for all of us. I told you this on the last one. Yeah. You're a good glue, man. Well, thanks, you keep brother. us all together because we will just keep making records and drift around and do whatever. And it takes people like you to really help us keep reaching the people and do what we we're born to do. I mean, a lot of us have a bend for living forever. And it's these documentations that, you know, if I ever have a grandson or someone else down the line might hear some of this stuff and once again going back to if we can inspire just one person in our life to be better and do better and maybe you know quell some pain that's a life worth living and you know i've i've watched you and and i, I did this last time you know i'm gonna speak for everybody man we love you and we appreciate you man and uh, it's just an honor to be here i love telling you things i ain't gonna tell nobody else in no other way yeah and uh <laughs> You know, this isn't some of this is a scoop, but I didn't want to talk about my my music and color and five senses to six. I wanted to drop that because I didn't want anyone to take my idea. But you know, talking with you, man, I I want that documented here. And I've told you, man, you're gonna you're getting this time and our time here to document some of the greatest talent in any city in any time. This town is incredible. Oh, yeah. I just hope there's, you know, and you're taking the market bigger than St. Louis, and that's what it needs. There's a neo-jazz neo soul thing happening in St. Louis and all kinds of stuff that is unreal. I don't know what's happening in New York. I'm about to go find out. But St. Louis is ridiculous. Yeah. I just wish there was enough people to, to sustain it. But we won't quit either. 
Right. We're going to keep doing it because we have to. It's 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 who we are. So thank you for documenting us and, and supporting us. I Absolutely, mean, that, yeah. that is money in our bank, literally and metaphorically, that without people like you, we don't get to keep doing it. We got to go, you know, schlep some burgers or do whatever we do. And, and that's no fun. Right. <laughs> love you, man. Yeah, I love you, Tim. Thanks, buddy. Thanks yeah. for everything. And uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, really happy with everything with the with my uh orb and uh, so thank you yeah appreciate you buddy yeah man right on well uh have a good day buddy i'll see you soon cheers bye everyone bye rock paper podcast rock paper podcast rock paper podcast well yeah that was it